just go ahead and get started. Uh, so again, the tool is called MAST. And what we want to show you is um, how we can use this tool to start querying for public metabolome across all public metabolomics data. And so um, broadly, the goals um, here are how do you use it and how do you explore the results? But let me first kind of give you um, a little bit of background. Um, and so Peter already kind of stole a little bit of the thunder, but it was um, with the sequencing community. Uh, it was, it's kind of taken for granted now, right? If you have an unknown sequence or a new sequencer that just came from your data that might be interesting, you can start asking the question, well, where else have I seen this particular sequence of, of, of DNA bases before? And so one of the key tools um, that was released in the early 90s uh, was called BLAST. And so there are several things you can start searching. First, you can search these uh, databases of uh, known, known uh, genes and with known function. Um, and so that's cool. So hopefully you have, you can get the function of that particular DNA sequence. But second, you can also start querying just all the data in the world. And you, for a lot of the genome, the coding regions are actually quite small. And so then the function of DNA sequences might not be might not be fully encapsulated in these known regions uh, where the, there's known function, but it's also interesting to just even ask the question, what kind of species, what kind of environments, what kind of organisms that these partic this particular DNA might have occurred in? And so with mass spectrometry, uh, we're taking a similar uh, analog to that. And so kind of the first tier that kind of existed over the last 15, 20 years within mass spectrometry is the ability to search your tandem mass spectra, which will function as a fingerprint for your molecule, against a database of known uh, tandem mass spectra with known structure. And so this has been available and is widely used to help re-identify known molecules. But the problem is these databases are quite small. And so just kind of a point of reference, today we can identify coming off a typical mass spectrometry, untargeted mass spectrometry run, maybe 5% of uh, the molecules that come out, which is a big improvement for, from seven, eight years ago, which it was in the tenths of percent. So we're looking at a 10x improvement in the past seven, eight years. I think that's pretty remarkable progress, but we're greedy people, so we always want more. Um, so the next step that we were thinking about is, well, if we can't get the full structure, maybe we can at least get some contextual information in a similar way you would do with a DNA sequence where you don't match to a known gene, but you actually blast it against all organisms in NCBI or short read archive. And so with MAST, we allow you to ask that question of a tandem mass spectrum and ask, have I ever in any context seen this particular spectrum before in the, actually today, uh, Peter just uh, tweeted about it. There's 1500 data sets available at GMPS, but what that comprises is about 30, almost 35 terabytes of data from nearly 200,000 uh, mass spectrometry runs. And then if you, if you want more numbers, it actually comes out to at least 500 million uh, tandem mass spectra in that, in that pool. So this is kind of the corpus of all public uh, small molecule natural products, metabolomics, um, mass spectrometry data that is publicly available that the community has deposited. And so we want to enable the ability to ask that question of where have I seen this in all of this data? And so this is, again, the very first step to make that possible. Um, it is not particularly fast, but, you know, we're working on things. Um, and so what I want to have us go through, actually, I'll just do a hands-on right now, is uh, is that we'll, we'll show you the particular interface to uh, enter the, your query, uh, nothing super fancy. And we will show you other ways, if you already are on GMPS, how you can automatically pull out your spectra and start making these queries, and then just kind of exploring the results. So let me go ahead and get out of this window. So, um, so if you all go to, um, mast.ucsd.edu, you will be greeted by this particular interface. 
So pretty simple. Um, it's kind of a little bit uh, a divorce from GMPS as an interface right now. Um, but does, is everybody able to, actually you can't say yes or no. So um, I'll, is, we'll give a few seconds for everybody to go there. And so what you can see is here, there's kinds of three um, panels. First, it's your search parameters. How do you want to configure the search? With BLAST, you have, you have other equivalent parameters for the sequencing world, and number of mutations that you allow, um, kind of organisms that you want to start searching, the size of the database you want to start searching. And then in this middle panel, the actual information. And so what you can see here is, Right now, we enable searching on a tandem mass spectrometry. Um, and so you have to have an MSMS spectrum uh, of your particular molecule or your data of interest. Uh, we can't simply search uh, precursor masses or uh, just the in intact mass of the molecule. So what you'll enter here is the precursor mass as well as the fragment peaks um, as a list. So each line represents a peak and it's separated. The first term is intensity and the second one is, uh, or it's the first one's mass and the second one is intensity. And so if you click populate demo, it'll put in example data here. And this happens to be a stenothricin natural product. Um, it's a peptidic natural product um, of some sort. And um, what you can see on this right side is you can add a description. I would say test mass um, query. Um, and then if you would like to be emailed whenever this is finished, you can go ahead and put that in. If you have a GMPS login, you can do that as well so that the result will be saved under your account. But if you don't have that, it's okay. It can do, you can do it anonymously. We're just trying to lower the barrier to entry for you to be able to query something. And so once you've entered that and you can get these peaks, um, first of all, Peter was doing some looking at old literature and kind of looking at the picture and kind of filling some of the stuff in. Um, but you can also grab it straight from your vendor software. Um, they can export these peak lists, um, or you can read it from MZML, MZXML files if you, if you have those already. Um, or again, we'll show you how to easily pull that out from an analysis directly on GMPS if you're already on the platform using molecular networking, feature-based molecular networking, um, and all these other tools that are that are kind of around it. So once you're done, you can click mass molecule. And what it'll do is it actually submits a job on GMPS. And here, since I did not actually use uh, a login, it's run under the quick start GMPS user that we see here. Um, this is great to get you going, but the one downside is um, this is not your account. So you can't actually go back to it unless you save this URL. So if you lose it, you lose it. But OK. So there's that. Um, and the, generally, the, the time that it takes to run um, is about uh, 10, 15 minutes, uh, depending on the query the, with the default parameters. There's some more advanced options that I'll just show you really quick um, that make it either really fast or really slow. So well, actually, this is as fast as it gets for this particular version. Um, but one thing, if you really want to make it slow, um, is you can turn on this option called analog search. So here, the very first thing that we did was do a query for this molecule for the exact same molecule across all the data. Um, and so that's the kind of the most basic question you can start asking. But a more advanced question, for those of you that are familiar with molecular networking, is asking the question of, are there any related molecules that could be in the public data? Perhaps there is a methylation or some sort of chemical or biochemical transformation that will allow you to cast a bigger net against the public data. And so um, that's what analog search allows you to do. It allows it to uh, match in exactly. And this, so in the same way, if you blast, there's some polymorphisms in the, in the nucleotides that it allows to match in a fuzzy way. Um, and so if you turn that on, um, it'll do that but at the cost of speed. So I won't quote you how long it'll take. It takes a while. So um, you're just searching a far, far um, larger search. So, so Bing, um, 
is there a way we can just turn on the microphones because the ability to ask questions would be really useful if there's some zoom bombing when somebody uh, has slurs or anything then we can shut it down again but yeah, i think let's, let's try it let's okay. try it um official to have people ask questions okay everyone <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Let's let's take questions. Any any questions out there? Yeah. Somebody raise their hand. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hey. Hi. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, cool tool. Uh, it is really a cool tool, Minx. And what I really uh, was wondering is that. Uh, how would you take into consideration the different ionizations uh, that uh, the data that comes out? So for example, it could be uh, the chemical ionization or uh, the electron ionization, and then the patterns that you would, that would emerge from these ionizations would be very different. So, so, so for some it might work, for some it might not. So, yeah, that's so a great think... question. That, that's a really good question. So I think I'm going to let Alan field this one. What you are going to? What you are going to? Oh, so, so, so that your question about different ionization me uh, methods. So, this this tool is largely to search the space. Um, for for really collision induced dissociation um, or 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 the you know the similar higher energy collision induced association HCD space, um, what you're talking about regarding EI fragmentation and, and really electron based fragmentation, um, yes, that is very different, right? As you as I think you understand from the base, yes. from your question, um, and, and that's something that um, we're building out a, an analogous system. Um, for DCMS data in, in JMPS. So I yeah. can imagine expanding that to the future. But really, this is intended to search the HCD or CID space. Exactly. And also, uh, I was just wondering uh, what kind of databases you, you would be really um, making the searches on. For example, there is an NIC database with uh, almost like 40, 50,000 compound spectra. There is HMDB. So how do you really integrate this information? With this mask. So, so what we're really searching on is the raw data that's deposited publicly um, in the databases. So this is not for an annotation thing. So this is not like a spectral library matching algorithm where we're searching against, say, like the NIST database. This is really taking what you observe in your MS2 spectra and searching against all the other MS2 spectra observed in all the files in the in the in the data repository. And then reporting back to you the, the information about that file. Exactly. Mink, can, Mink can follow up a little bit more, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Uh Yeah. No, that was that was a great discussion. So I'll just show you some of the results, and I think hopefully it'll be a little bit more clear on um, the class of answer um, that Mass can give you. Um, we very much appreciate. It would be awesome to get structure, right? Um, that, that again, as Alan mentioned, that's the realm of spectral library search, which is another thing on GMPS and the other tools in the community um, have been doing this for about 20 years. Um, but here, um, it's, it's a, a different, different kind of answer. So um, we'll move on to that in just a second. Did anybody else have uh, other questions? Uh, I have another question, like about the big list. How do you get the big list? For that, the fragments. Okay, so that uh, will depend on your software of choice. How are you exploring your mass spectrometry data? Um, so, do you what? Are, what kind of software? What kind of platform? And what kind Hunter. of software do you usually use? If I'm using Mass Hunter, I am. That's Ag Agilent. Agilent, yeah. Um, I don't actually use real so like. Vendor software, oh, okay. so um, I'm uh, not. I, exactly I, have, I have an answer to this uh, a, a little bit. So, so I think Mass Hunter, you can export the MS2, and based on that, if for some reason your software doesn't allow you to export it, 
because it's uh, it's the paired mass and then the fragment ions and their relative intensities it since we search a single spectrum you can copy and paste that and then create your own msms spectrum and then add that uh, into the mass search and so it, it can be done manually as well um, I've gone personally into uh, supporting information of papers and actually measured the relative intensity with a ruler and then give a rough estimate of where that mass really is you know, within the Dalton and then just set my search parameters pretty high and then you're still able to find, uh, sometimes still able to find some of these things. Um, and so you need to, the other thing that you can do is it, yeah. The, uh, the ion information, the MSMS information, and fill in the parent pass. And so it's, it's, it, it, it's whatever you have available to you. And, and also, how, how strict is the peak intensity will affect the search? Like, if I use different collision energies, it will give different intensities of the ions. So how does it take it in, into account during the search? <laughs> So this is actually quite related to the last question about different instruments. Um, it's a little subtle of a point. Um, broadly, it does matter. Um, so if you have a completely different collision energy than what the rest of the community runs, and as a consequence, the fragmentation looks completely different, um, we, it won't match. So it, 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 it does matter. Um, but generally, uh, one, one of the, the things that might help is if you are able to get identification to spectral libraries, um, you're probably in roughly the right ballpark of collision energies that people, that the rest of the community is using, um, and you're probably okay. Um, and there's, I'm sure with your instrument, there's some tuning parameters that the vendor provides for MSMS fragmentation, standard compounds. Um, but this is kind of me just conjecturing, so. Yeah, so I think this is a, a, I think it's an important point. So so the intensities will vary. Let's say you change your collision entities, your, your intensities will vary. If they vary really dramatically, um, then what you will see is that you're not gonna find matches. And so you're matching against what's available in the public domain. And, and so if there's a lot of, uh, you know, data that is available with your particular uh, collision energies, you will get uh, a lot more likely you're, you're going to get matches to the information. Now we mitigate some of this and, and I, I, so one of the things that's uh, applied to mo uh, the spectra before it's largely processed, uh, Ming can correct me if I'm incorrect uh, if this is still happening, but we used to apply a square root to each of the spectra. And what that does is it decreases the impact of high intensity ions and it increases the impact of low intensity ions. And that mitigates a little bit the impact of the really large variations that you see. And so, you know, if within your search parameters and within your search spectrum that you're using, you don't get matches, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But if you do get matches, now you can start to get additional information uh, about it. And you're really leveraging the community data, which is uh, hasn't been possible before. Uh, yeah, so Peter's correct in terms of uh, the pre-processing whenever we determine uh, spectral similarity. And so the square root helps quite a bit to uh, compress dynamic range. Um, where you de-emphasize some of the intensity, but it still matters. So again, if it's, as Peter said, if it's way, way off, yeah, you're, it's, you're kind of screwed, there's no hope. But if there's some shift just because you're off by five uh, electron volts, or it's just a different platform, but you're roughly in the same ballpark, it'll help make, it'll help make them more similar. Um, other alternatives to this, um, is you can reduce the similarity thresholds. So if you reduce the cosine similarity, but this naturally has the consequence of increasing false positives. Uh, so this is kind of a careful balance. 
Yeah, so, so it's, you have to make a decision whether you want to really do a broad search, you know, find all candidate relation, uh, similar uh, molecules. So this would be the equivalent in sequencing, saying, okay, I am willing to accept a very low threshold of similarity between my sequences. And then I will go deeper into that data and say, uh, say, uh, say something more about it. But if you want to be uh, really specific and you want to say, I only want to find my identical spectra, then you have to set your search query, uh, queries very strict. Also, if anybody on, uh, that is on wants to talk and, and the uh, mute button or unmute button does not work, just say, uh, put in the chat that you want to uh, ask a question. And then you will get un unmuted. We have one person with their hand raised. Yeah, I want. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question for this that you said for crossing. Actually, I, I ran the same mask in the morning for my own sample, but I didn't get any hints. So I was thinking maybe I should change like the crossing the scores or something that um, right now you are talking about. but. I don't know what is the range of this also. So in which range I can play. And my compounds that I'm working is tritep and glycose. It's actually in my molecular network, I also didn't get any hits. How many ions does the spectrum contain? So, so when the number of ions in a spectrum is very low, it would be the equivalent of searching uh, two amino acids in a, a gene repository and those results will just not be informative. And so if you have low spectral information, uh, you're just not going to be able to get anything useful out of it. And so uh, what's, have you looked at that? No, I didn't. Okay. And, and, it's, and it's quite possible that a search of the repository um, for your particular compound, it, it may have not just been observed before. Um, you know, we have a lot of data, but it by no means covers everyone's application or your particular organism even. Um, so I think that's one of the caveats in terms of um, the limitation of the search results. However, as people contribute their data ever increasingly, um, and Peter just uh, tweeted out the other day that you know massive has reached 1500 data sets um and 35 terabytes of data so it's it's a an impressive collection that's growing every day but it could still be the case that it just does not match anything yeah. and one other uh suggestion is just i'm seeing uh so we we kind of monitor whenever results are good or bad um we probably should report this but sometimes people search cent or uh, profile data um, as opposed to centroided data. So that's one of the caveats to be aware of. Um, it has to be centroided. Everything um, in a database is centroided. So if you search profile data, it, it basically won't come up with anything. Um, that being said, um, kind of your question about what are the right parameters, generally the defaults are what we recommend, the cosine of 0 0.7. And anything below that, it starts getting into it matches everything kind of territory. And the other parameter that, let me just share my screen really quickly, um, that is, is quite sensitive is the minimum matched peaks. So if we look here, um, on, there's a minimum cosine score and minimum match peaks. And so if you have your minimum peaks uh, quite a bit lower than six, so somewhere around four or below, as Peter said, it's gonna match to a lot of different things. So we would recommend to keep it somewhere around six. Um, but the problem is, um, if your fragmentation of the tandem mass spectrum has less than that, um, it makes it quite difficult. Just because if you have four peaks and you're requiring six, well, you're not going to match anything. So um, that's kind of natural limitations. And this is more of a problem when you're talking about smaller and smaller molecules. Um, but less so when you're talking about um, the high hundreds of Daltons um, and for peptidic-like molecules, generally this is not a problem. But uh, a lot of the primary metabolites that are quite small, um, 
they fragment quite poorly and it, it doesn't it generally doesn't perform so well. And so, any other questions? These are these are fantastic. So I think, uh, shy. Hello, hey, I'm mute. Um, I have a question about uh, carryover and contamination. Does mass uh, relate to that? Alan, what about uh, you? Want to feel this one? So, so carryover is not necessarily addressed. However, um, you could certainly search contaminants. Um, and if you were to search a spectrum that you believe is to be a contaminant found in a large number of samples, um, a large number of files in the database, that might kind of reflect that. Um, but that's not really a, an application that I think was originally intended. But that's an actually a, a really interesting suggestion that it could be used for that purpose. So what might happen is that it starts to show up in a lot of blanks. That should give you some insight that it's either background or uh, potential carryover. And that is something to pay attention to. Uh, we rely on the community to deposit their data as they publish their papers, they put things in the public domain, um, or if they want to analyze and they are really forward looking and, and make things uh, available in the public domain, then uh, yeah, you're going to see there, there may be things that are observed in, uh, due to carryover. Um, that warrants a deeper inspection of that particular data set. Once you find a match, you need to do your due diligence and say, okay, I want to either inspect that data a little bit more to see if there's issues with carryover and such. And you may have to contact the authors who deposited the data set. And just to follow up on that, I think um, you. Uh, if we if we go to the results screen or once we cover that um the information that's displayed will maybe be partially informative um as peter said we it will say if it's been found in blanks or, or people who have reported things as being blanks as well as if you believe it you know if you're running urine samples and if you get hit to something that's fairly exotic um maybe that's you know something that's um from a prior run on the same column or or something that has carried over just a thought Yeah, and I think one of the key questions here too is um, when you're talking about carryover and talking about blanks is how do we know that a file in the public domain is a blank file or, or what is even the run order um, in which the samples were acquired? And so the run order question is a little harder, but um, whether you know the sample, how you figure out the sample type, if it's a blank or if it's a real sample or not, um, we'll show you in just a second and there's actually another workshop coming up um, that will hopefully allow you to annotate your own data so that you can remember if it's a blank in the future so that's kind of a separate thing um, but let me go ahead and share my screen um, and show you the results page uh, some of you it might have finished running um, but there's a demonstration example on the google doc does everybody see my screen Okay, so um, now you're here, um, you finished it. Um, this is just the example that, that we, we did. Um, and so you can see at the very top, one of the things we do is it searches the libraries. So that's just kind of a, a, a gimme right there. Um, you, you probably wanna search your libraries just in case it does hit something. Um, but in a, lot of, in a lot of cases, you probably, it probably doesn't hit anything that's probably why the reason you're using mass or one of the reasons why you're using mass. So this particular molecule, it's surfactant C14, or at least that's what it matches to um, in the spectral libraries. That's not particularly interesting. Let's not worry about it too much. But what hopefully might be more interesting is there's a section called community matches. And so there's only one link down here called data set matches. And so if you go ahead and click on it, um, what this is, it'll give you a table. And whenever we have your particular spectrum, and we, we, we can call it, you can use the verb, if we masked it against um, all public data, 
um, it might hit to some public data sets. And so here we summarize which um, data sets that it actually matches to. And so hopefully this gives you some contextual information given that, uh, given that you have the name of the data set, the organisms that come from it, as well as potentially a long description about what, what the paper or what the data set sample preparation is like. Um, but it won't give you everything. And as Peter said before, it's worth it to likely contact the author uh, and a depositor of that data. But what we can see here is we know that stenothricin is produced by um, some streptomyces strains. And so um, the data, so here it matches the eight data sets. Um, and so we actually see it in a lot of these uh, papers that include streptomyces or is bacteria that, in general. Is everybody able to follow along where he is at this point uh, that wants to follow along? Or is there anybody who wants to follow along that has not been able to? If, you, if, if that's you, then let us know. Okay, great. Just, uh, just in case you didn't, you were a little shy. So if you're on the Google Doc, um, there's a link called Example Mass for Stenothricin. So you can click on that, um, and then it'll take you to uh, where, where I'm looking. Um, but again, so we can see eight of these data sets, and they're all of microbial in origin. Um, and so that gives us some confidence that this particular uh, molecule um, is, is it present in these microbial data sets. Um, whether they're being produced by bacteria or in the media and things like that, that's kind of up for interpretation. Um, but uh, depending, depending on your particular molecule, one of the things you can do is you can click on view mirror match, and then it'll give you um, a visualization of the match between your spectrum and the one in the data set. So this happens to be exactly this compound, so it's a cosine score of one. Um, but you can kind of go down the list and you can see how well your spectrum that you queried matches the particular data set here on the bottom. So um, again, there's the description of the data set um, and the organism and all kind of these match parameters and the deltas in terms of parent mass. But also what might be more interesting is it allows you to start digging a little bit deeper into the specific files. And so you can see that it seems to have been found in seven files in this data set, uh, three files here, 14 files here. And each of these files represents um, a full uh, mass spectrometry run. Um, and so if you want to dig a little bit deeper and see what files those are, um, we allow for that with the link out here. It says view file matches. And so that'll open a new tab and it'll tell you, okay, it's this data set ID here. Um, and this is the file name um, for that data set. Um, and so if you found in somebody else's data, you might be wondering, well, this doesn't really help me. Um, you would be right. We kind of ran into the same problem. Um, and so we provided a link out here that says view metadata. If the author had spent the time to add extra metadata describing this file, what kind of sample preparation, what kind of LC, what kind of um, uh, ionization instrument, things like that, it will show up. Unfortunately, these particular data sets don't have that metadata, but we're, again, we're going to show you later how for your own data sets, you can kind of store that information so you never have to remember again. Um, so that's kind of a future thing, um, but this allows you to dig a little bit deeper. One of the other things you can do if you go back to this um, data set page, there is another link called View Spectrum Matches. So if you click on that, instead of telling you the file, it tells you the exact scan number and file name within uh, that, that, you, that you actually match to. And so what this hopefully will allow you to do is if you wanna actually start really digging in deep, you know what the scan number is, you can find that peak um, in the data and you can actually start visualizing um, exactly uh, the spectrum that it matched to and start inspecting what's going on and vetting that whether you truly believe that it was also found there. So these are ways that um, we think can be interesting to explore that data. Um, but another thing that we, we kind of want to bring it full circle, right? 
So imagine that you're looking for stenothricin. Um, in this particular case, it's a peptidic natural product. Um, but you want to find more analogs of it. You want to find the chemical diversity of that particular molecule um, and see if you can find new variants of it that you had not observed in your own data. Imagine you could see maybe one particular variant of it in your data, um, but now you want to look, you want to cast a bigger net, but then your fishing line and what you're, you're, you're kind of pulling is this molecule, but you can pull the full data sets and files with it. So what you can do is there's a link out here that's called Reanalyze Files Found. And so what this allows you to do is, for those of you familiar with molecular networking, is say, OK, I have found, just as an example, I have found stenothricin in, let's say, in this case, this adds up to maybe 50 uh, files, 50 uh, samples in all the public data. That's great. Now let's make a molecular network out of all of those. Um, so just historically, it's been very tedious to do something like this. So we try to make it a little easier. So if you click on Analyze Files Found, and then there's, you have to actually click on a second link here. Um, and what it'll do is you can see here, it says it'll pre-populate a molecular networking job for you. And it'll pre-select all of the files in public data that contain stenothricin. And so now, um, since that's selected automatically for you, you can adjust some settings. And then you can hit go. Oh, I need to add a title. Okay. So, so if you add a title and you hit go, it'll automatically launch a job for you. Um, and then once it's done, hopefully what you can do is you can start looking at the diversity around stenothricin by pulling all of these data sets that contain it um, from, from the public domain. And so I actually don't know um, what we're going to find, honestly. I did this a little bit earlier um, just to show it was we can do it. Um, but let's let's actually go and see. Steno. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, factin, sorry. Um, so if we look at that, this is hopefully the family um, of, that, of the molecule that we just saw. And so just as an example here, um, this is a molecular network. Each again, each of these circles represents um, to a first approximation, a unique molecule. And we can see kind of this diversity in masses, um, but they're all around 1,000. And so if you switch over to um, the identifications, there's a big family of these surfactants, um, different uh, lipid chain lengths. And, but there's all the, also in gray here, these new, surf, putatively new surfactant molecules um, that were not identified in the libraries, but putatively they're related. Um, and so this is one way, hopefully, that you can kind of enrich for uh, the chemical diversity of a particular molecule of interest. So that's, that's one of the ways that we think is interesting. But additionally to that, kind of, again, closing the loop, um, what you can do is if you run a molecular network and you found something interesting in your data, and you're like, well, let's start querying the public data for it. If you are in view all clusters with ID right here, on this left side, there's a link called masked spectrum. So if you click on that, what it'll, ha what it'll do is it'll go in the system, find your, that particular spectrum. So let's go back and kind of look at it really quick. This is the spectrum we're looking at here. And so these are the peaks, and you can play with it interactively. But if you click mass spectrum, it'll take those peaks, format it in such a way such that it pre-populates the precursor MZ and pre-populates um, your fragmentation peaks. So I mean, if, if, I, if I can interject with that, there yeah. are a couple of questions in the chat about how to get that peak list. Um, and I had responded in the chat, but I think it's important to note that going to mass.ucsd.edu and putting in the peak list is not the only way to do this. The Probably the easiest way to actually interact with this is exactly how Ming is showing it. We've integrated these buttons throughout all the workflows. Yeah, so we're trying to make it's at least as a cohesive ecosystem, you can kind of call other tools automatically without really thinking about it. Um, a, a second aside to kind of the ease in which this happens, and this brings up um, these questions about using Mass Hunter and other vendor software, is actually it's very easy for vendors to create a URL 
and direct link outs from their own software um, into this interface to pre-populate the query. So right now it might be difficult, but it doesn't have to be. So if you have a representative and say, hey, I want you to make a mass link in your software, hopefully they'll respond and we'll just tell them how to do it. So the, if, if that matters to you and you think that's meaningful, please tell um, your representative at whatever instrument manufacturer and we can all work together to make it a little bit easier. So, so I have a question. So yes. can I download any of the files that I found like by must search? You should be able to. So it's not as easy um, as we should have made it, but we can make it easier. So what you can see here is if you found a file that you have right here, um, if you go to massive data sets in this link up top, you can find that particular data set. And so here we go. And you can go to the FTP link. OK, this is a lot more convoluted than I thought. Um, so and then you copy this URL here, and you paste it afterwards. And so, and so now you can see it, it downloads. So if it's meaningful, what we can do is we can turn this directly into an FTP link. So then you just click it, and it'll just download. OK, that's, yeah, it'll be great. Yeah, okay. it'll be great. Yeah. Yeah, and no, let's do that. Let's do, it's, it's all there, so we might as well just make it a little bit easier. Um, that's a great point. That's something we actually have not thought about just because we kind of live in this, this GMPS platform, but we will also want to make it a little easier to kind of export out. Um, one thing that might not be possible is for, you, for, for us to give you like a zip of all the files, but if we write the FTP link in this table, you can simply download the table and then you can you can just download all the files one by one, either automatically writing code, or there, I believe some FTP software allows you to provide a list of FTP URLs, and it'll just download all of them. So that's kind of just look ahead. Good. Thank you. Any other questions so far? Hey, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. So is it possible to access mass from like a spectrum library search? Like if I have a molecule of interest, I just like type it in. I don't see oh, like- Oh, you mean a, a known spectral, uh, known reference spectrum. Is that- Yeah. Exactly? So not yet. So we, uh, we can make it uh, available. One of the ways, actually, so let me- so, Well, there's, there's, there's kind of a half answer, right? They could use Chemical Explorer through Redo. Right, which is kind of a different topic, but it, it kind of gets to the same point. Um, essentially, we've gone ahead and done the math search for you and tabulated the result. Um, however, that's it only reports um, on files for which we have some metadata for. So it's a complete math search, essentially. So broadly, yeah, it's not particularly streamlined. Um, it's something we can do. Um, there's actually a new a piece of work that we're hoping to get submitted soon. It's called um, a metabolomic spectrum resolver. And uh, so there's like, for different spectral library resources, um, there are one of the sources of data. You can provide just essentially a string. So let me just, I showed it off before, but um, let me just kind of show you here. So it, we can generate, oh, actually, that's not a library. Uh, so GMPS library. So we can generate this string that describe that that's an identifier for a library spectrum and so one thing we can think about um, is putting that as an option here instead of entering the peaks manually you put that identifier we know internally how to go out grab those peaks and then and make a spectrum out of it um, and so if you enter that link and it can we can take those peaks and query it that way and so that might be a decent way that we can support not only within GMPS, but these identifiers also work across resources such as MassBank. So if there's a spectrum in MassBank that is not in GMPS, you put that identifier in, and then we even run over to MassBank, grab the data, and then it'll do your mass query. So perhaps that's a decent um, way for us to achieve that, if that's helpful. 
Cool, thank you. Can I, can I just add in also, you could go to um, the library spectrums page, like actually find it in the library. And then if you just download spectrum peaks, um, then that's an MGF file and you can actually open that in a text editor and get the peaks. Yep, exactly. Yeah, so this precursor and then these are all the peaks. So you can just literally copy the peaks. Um, I th that's a very good suggestion, Emily. Um, for now, I think that's kind of the recommended thing. Um, it's a little annoying right now, so we'll hopefully make that easier, but it's definitely a, um, a workaround if there's a particular molecule that you're interested in. Um, just a few more clicks. Okay, I think uh, somebody raised their hand. Uh, I, I have a question. Um, yes. This is Crystal Longnecker. I'm calling, I'm calling from Hui, um, I, which is Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, as you are trying to get more or getting more databases from metabolites and other places, I'm wondering if you have a way to maintain the primary contact information for the people who've downloaded those databases so that people can easily contact them. Because when I'm looking at what you have now at, in GMPS, the mm -hmm. primary point of contact is somebody at UCSD, not the people who are submitting the databases at Metabolites and other places. No, that's a very good point. Um, one of the things is we, uh, we should, so we, yeah, we have kind of our own internal structure of like who actually submitted it. One of the things that we'll likely do um, is simply link back out to Metabolites, um, just kind of, just change the URL um, or, or the name and just link back out. And so they can actually, their, their uh, metabolites will maintain that particular um, URL. So that's something historically we haven't done a particularly good job of, about, but that's, you bring up a good point. Okay, thank you. Any other hey, Ming. Yes. So I ran a mass search for a molecule in uh, for a mass spectrum in my data mm -hmm. and all the community matches say gnps is that is that because there wasn't a metabolites or a metabolomics workbench uh, data set that matched or yeah so that's a good point so one of the things that um there, there's the kind of two uh factors at play is we did an import from metabolites actually a couple of years ago and we're working on automating that so that we're always up to date from metabolites and metabolomics workbench. Um, so that was, that's kind of the first uh, issue, kind of our fault, it's a little out of date. Um, number two, uh, one of the things that we found whenever we did import at the time is a lot of the data sets that were deposited at each of these institutions um, lacked tandem mass spectrometry information. Um, a lot of them were simply MS1. Um, and those we decided not to import just because we don't really, we, our wheelhouse is, is utilizing tandem aspect spec information. Um, and so we decided not to import those and they wouldn't have matched anyway. So um, it's kind of both those factors at play that limit the, um, the matching ability to those particular resources. Um, yeah. So uh, I think one of the key issues is that uh, both Metabolomics Workbench and uh, Metabolites, they don't have metadata associated whether something has tandem mass spectrometry or not. And so you have to systematically go through each data set. And so for Metabolomics, uh, for Metabolites, they were, help, uh, they were helpful and they provided us with a potential spreadsheet of data that has MSMS data in it. Uh, I'm sure uh, that was only a partial list of that truly has MSMS data in it. Uh, whereas Metabolite, uh, Metabolomics Workbench just doesn't have any of that record. And so it, it it's Im almost impossible to uh, find it. Um, and so those were some of the limitations. Uh, the, then the third uh, reason why this likely is there's a, I think GMPS is all built on MSMS data, whereas Metabolomics Workbench and Metabolites, they take any, uh, or they, they basically, you can deposit any type of mass spec data, uh, MS1 or even uh, annotated tables they consider that mass spec as well. And so those are not useful for us. And so from a perspective of 
MSMS, uh, most of the MSMS data that exists in the public domain probably is routed through GMPS Massive as opposed to the other resources and a, and a smaller number that are stored in metabolites, etc. Does that, that make sense? Yes, yes it does, thank you. Yeah, we are communicating next week with metabolites to see if we can get uh, a, uh, those two platforms talking to each other so that if uh, untargeted metabolomics that has MSMS in it gets uploaded to metabolites, that's our goal at least, um, that that automatically gets pushed into uh, GMPS. And so it becomes searchable with MAST. And then we also automatically, the hope is to automatically display those results from MAST in metabolites as well. That's great. I think MAST really highlights the usefulness of, uh, you know, good metadata with the data sets because, uh, yeah, this is really useful to see where. Cor correct. Else. And, and uh, I think there will be another workshop on redo where the met metadata is the critical part of this and it will feed mm. into mass as well. Um, so I, if you really care about metadata and how to curate it and those kind of things, uh, the redo workshop will be really valuable for that. Yeah, that will be in two, it's for two weeks from today. Um, I'll, I'll chat everyone um, the information. It'll be on the same website that you got here from um, workshop pages on the GMPS documentation. Wonderful, thank you. And yeah, so just kind of, I, I like to bring up funny anecdotes. One of the, the issues uh, as Peter highlighted was whenever we did the initial imports from uh, Metabolomics Workbench as well as Metabolites is we wanted to make the data in consistent um, in open formats. So specifically MZ, uh, I believe at the time it was MZXML, but we uh, recently switched to MZML. Um, we had to convert all of the data um, before we could figure out if there were MS2s um, within, within them. So um, I co-opted every Windows machine at the time in the lab to convert this terabytes of data that I, was, that I was trying to process. And I was trying to graduate at the time too and do my thesis defense. So it was like, I need your Windows machines. We must get this all converted so we can kind of do a meta now. That was, anyway, that was, that was kind of fun. Um, so that's kind of some of the uh, bottlenecks in making these things uh, streamlined and automated. Uh, since then, we have figured out better technical solutions. So hopefully it'll be easier now, but um, kind of making everything work without any human intervention of all different data types, um, it's, I, I think Google and Facebook and those kinds of companies kind of spoil us into thinking that everything just kind of works. So um, we're, we're working hard, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, everything will just hopefully be seamless in the future. Um, but okay, so that's mostly all I wanted to share with you all. Um, again, this is kind of just very modest. Hopefully it gave you some background and you all asked some really good questions. Um, any, any questions from you all uh, about MAST or other things in GMPS? We can also highlight some look-aheads about future workshops um, just to be like, hey, it'll be fun. Um, but the floor is, the floor is to, to you all. Hi, Mixu. Hi, Christopher. Um, I just wondering is we reduce the kind of database that we are looking for it may improve the, the, the time of each experiment or not. Since I'm, I'm working with natural product, I don't have anything to do with the synthetic database or negative since all, most of my experiments are positive. Oh, yes. Okay, so that's a, that's a good question um, in terms of speeding things up. Right now, our kind of delineations on the public databases you can search are the GMPS ones, or metabolized metabolomics workbench or all of them together. We don't make the distinction between uh, different types of samples, number one, because people don't provide that information. Um, but one thing we can start doing because tools like Redo where we do have per file annotations for types, we can start filtering on that. So one of them would be um, just the most natural and maybe not relevant to you is we know if it's um, a plant versus an animal. So that's one of the distinctions that we could make, and that will limit the search space. 
Unfortunately, right now, um, it's really like an algorithmic limitation for speed. Um, so it's, you know, you know how it is. The first, the first version is never the final version. Um, so what, there are some implementations where we have made it very fast, where you don't even have to make the database small, um, and it's very, very quick. Um, but those are not ready for prime time just yet. So um, I think uh, revisiting those kinds of issues whenever our database instead of 35 terabytes is 350 terabytes really makes sense. But right now, kind of our way to sort, it, we need to solve these problems algorithmically with better software as well. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> But any, it doesn't have to be all about masks. It can be about anything. We're just kind of, we're, we're, we are a resource for you all. Don't worry, I know. And the last time I, I bring a really huge network and I, you took down my, my running several times. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of the challenge of, you know, as we build out these tools, people are running larger and larger data sets that it wasn't necessarily intended to, to run at first, as Mink can attest to. So now that we give the ability to select thousands of files um, pretty easily, or even query entire databases you know, with your MSMS, there is some algorithmic challenges that have kind of arisen. Right, Ming? No, it's fine. Everything works. No problem. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's good. These are, I think these are good problems to have, right? So kind of back in the day, the biggest data set that we ever worked with was this um, 3D skin cartography um, analysis from 2012, 2013. Um, and it was like 600 files. And we thought this was, you know, the, the biggest thing we'd ever have to work with. And now Alan kind of comes to me and says, well, I want to analyze 12,000 files. Um, so you know, it's a fun time. Um, but uh, so one of the things is uh, we're mostly done for the workshop today. Um, but what I wanted to show off to you all, um, just kind of the contextual information that m enriches MAST a lot more is um, how is, is this tool called Redo. So you've probably heard about it. Um, yeah, any other questions? Anyone? Yeah. Okay. Oh no, sorry. Go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, so for this massive, uh, still I don't know um, for mass. Sorry, not massive, but uh, for my data because I'm using the, like the crude extracts, and then I have I have the molecular network of the molecules that I see. As a uh, sub, as a like a metabolite, but then I cannot really track them and also get any hits for those. So uh, still, I don't know. I also actually tried to deposit like one of the spectrals at least in the massive and try to find out any like maybe similarities or something. Nothing happened. Um, yeah, I again I reached to the point that Alan said maybe it is because I'm using I'm working with marine invertebrates, sea cucumber mainly. So and so far I just know that one person like I just found one person that had a, that worked with molecular network with sea cucumber. So I don't know how can I use this tool because it's really cool. I really like it. What I get, it's also amazing, but um, I don't know how can I, you know, fortify what I have in literature. So that is my point at the moment, actually. Yeah, yeah so mask also. I, I think, well, especially if you're studying a new system, um, you know, it pays to be a pioneer, but also it sucks. So um, one of the things, there's, there's several things I think uh, I would recommend. Number one is in, in the context of mast. Um, your lab must have some historical mass spectrometry data that for previous related projects that you collected, hopefully, or they're on some hard drive somewhere in some closet. Um, if you do, 
Um, one of the things I would recommend is first, if you can deposit that publicly um, on, on Massive, you don't rely on the rest of the community, which is not collect, seems that they're not collecting that kind of data. At least you can save yourself some time. So if you mass something and you've uploaded all of your historical data, then it'll match at least to your data so you can have an understanding. I've seen this molecule in this file of mine before. So that'll save you some time. Um, and then hopefully that's an avenue for you to start co-networking specific files that might um, have analogs for you. Um, but going along the route of identifying compounds uh, that, that are relevant. So maybe there's, there's two issues that could be happening. Number one is uh, there are just no known compounds for your particular system. Um, you know, that means there's more to discover. So maybe that's a there problem. There are no compounds in uh, GMPS Massive. Yes, yes, exactly. No compounds in the spectral libraries that are the, like the known structures. Um, but number two is perhaps you are collecting your tandem mass spectra in a, under, under, under a different setting that does not actually match uh, what the rest of the community or what has already been uploaded into the reference spectral libraries. And so to assess this kind of second possibility, it might be worth getting a few standards, uh, getting tandem mass spectra that we know we have a reference spectra for and running those standards seeing if you can re-identify those standards. And if you can't, um, perhaps tuning how you actually acquire the tandem mass spectra. Um, but if they can, then that gives you confidence that nobody else, at least within GMPS, uh, the spectral libraries has identified those compounds before. That's not to say that nobody's discovered them, but at least nobody's deposited them. Um, again, there's a big gulf between what's in PubChem versus what we have uh, tandem mass spec data for. But these are kinds of the possibilities and next steps I would recommend. And if, you know, if I could put my natural products chemist hat on, you know, every, you know, we're, you know, people are interested in novel chemical space. So not getting a hit would actually be very interesting, right? Like it doesn't give you any added context, but it could really reflect that something you're observing really unique compared to what other people have studied. Uh, I have a question. Yep. Oh, so I can see some messages in JNPS which are which are correlated with the known molecules, but uh, I guess spectra are not deposited for those molecules, so there is no network that I can see. Uh, and uh, those molecules has been discovered by some labs which are outside of USA. So I wanted to know using MAST will be helpful, like uh, uh, for me to get get direct hits for those known molecules. I mean, how GNPS library hits will be different, or can get how MAST can give more information about the data sets than GNPS libraries. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, they serve two roles, um, and they give you two different answers. So with spectral library search, it tells you, has anybody seen this molecule before and annotated the compound name and or structure, right? So it'll hopefully give you a structural, putative structural uh, identification. Um, but what MASS will do, it'll give you more contextual information. So you won't get the structural information out, but you'll have an understanding of where this molecule has been seen in kind of chemical and biological context. So if you're talking about um, like marine, uh, marine systems, if you see the molecule in some terrestrial plant, um, that's, that's interesting. So those, that's, that's how these two things um, will, how library search and mass complement each other. Um, so does that kind of answer some of that question? Yeah, thank you. 